Today is Palm Sunday, and uh, I love it. I, I think it's beautiful, and I, I love remembering. Uh, I love remembering all the things. I love. That's why we do communion. We love to remember because when you remember, you become grateful again and again. It just recenters you and it refocuses you. And today, I really want to hone in on why Jesus came. I mean, He is the Prince of Peace, right? He's the King of Peace in this case, and He comes triumphantly entering into Jerusalem the week before He is about to go to the cross and rise again, and He comes in peace. And I just so know that right now we're living in a world where the peace of mankind is void. It's lacking in such a major way. We have more anxious people than we've ever had. We've got more depressed people than we ever have, more fearful people than we ever have. And that, that goes for the church as well. I mean, I'm seeing so much turmoil and angst and, and calamity going on in people's hearts, fear of the unknown, fear of how the world's gonna end, fear of government structures, fear of all these things. And I'm thinking we've got to 2000. And 22, I think we're gonna be okay. God is on the throne, God is victorious, but we just lose our way sometimes. And right now we're looking for certain things and certain people to bring us peace. When we've really got to understand that the whole reason why Jesus came to this earth was to restore us back to the Father and give us peace that surpasses all understanding. And I want us to read about this triumphant en entry of as Jesus comes to Jerusalem as the King of Peace. Mark chapter 11, verse one, it says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, Bethphage, I don't know how to say that, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of His disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that had, they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. This is a huge deal. This is Jesus entering into Jerusalem around the time of Passover where everybody is in this part of the world. This is a huge declaration that Jesus is making as He comes on this donkey and presents Himself as King of the Jews. King, the Messiah has come. This is going to totally uh, you know, disorient all the uh, Pharisees and all the religious leaders. This is going to freak people out. This is like a suicide mission, if you like. This is Jesus coming in on a donkey and He's making His way into Jerusalem as King, the triumphant King. Could you imagine the expectation in the air? Could you imagine finally they'd been listening to Jesus for three years, talking about the kingdom of God has come, talking about a new kingdom, talking about a superior kingdom, telling them how to go about this kingdom. And so in their minds, you see, they have been reading the prophecies. They've been reading what is to come of the Messiah. They've been waiting with bated breath for their Messiah to come come and deliver them out of bondage, out of oppression, out of uh, this rule of the Roman Empire, no longer being oppressed, but finally free for the temple to be rebuilt, for the, for the, for the community to be leaders and not followers, slaves, no longer slaves, but free. The expectation that the Messiah is gonna come and emancipate them. 
The Messiah has come to finally do away with their political regime, finally come and do away with that which has been oppressing the people. And Jesus chooses to come in on a donkey. You know, we see the donkey as a yucky kind of animal, even though I have two beautiful uh, Jerusalem donkeys that live next door to us. They make the most horrendous sound, but they are so cute. They actually have a big cross on them. They actually escaped out of my neighbor's yard one day when Pastor Henry was having a meeting before we launched the college. And there you will find Pastor Henry and Pastor Paul chasing the Jerusalem donkeys in our yard. And it was hilarious. So these donkeys are very stubborn. They didn't listen to Dottie, my neighbour. They didn't listen to Henry or Paul. They, I mean, they, they were literally trying to get these, wrangle these donkeys into, I mean, they're, they're, you know, another word for them starts with an A, ends with an S. You fill in the blanks. That's how we see donkeys. Stubborn, not so attractive, kind of random animals. But not in Jesus' time, not in even the times of kings in history. You see, when a king came in on a horse, he was about to declare war. But when a king rode in on a donkey, he declared peace. See, it was a very intentional choice of an animal that he had set apart, a sacred entry of peace, this peaceful entry into Jerusalem, not declaring war, but coming in as the King of Peace. The one who was going to mess with the minds of the people because their expectation was one of David's son. Our father David, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. You see, David, King David was a man of war. The kings that they had asked for, even though God was their king, that wasn't enough for the people of Israel. They wanted a king, lowercase king. And therefore they had many kings, but those kings never actually brought them peace. Some were wicked, some were faithful. Some were wicked, some were faithful. And yet they never really got the emancipation that they'd been believing for, waiting for their King, the Messiah. And yet He chooses to come on a donkey. This is the God that we served. He's always messing with our narrative. Have you ever expected how something needed to go and it doesn't go the way you expected? You have built up the scenario in your mind. You have planned the whole thing out. You have got it in detail, in lists. You've even done a scrapbook about it. I mean, you've got all the things because you know in your mind it needs to look a certain way and when it doesn't, disappointment sets in. You see, disappointment is just unmet expectation. And here we have the people surrounding Jesus screaming out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now. Salvation has come as we've just heard. It was, this is the moment. He's going to save us the way we have been seeing it in our minds, the way it's been prophesied over. See, they were quoting Psalm 118, which was the conqueror's Psalm. It was about the house of David. David was a man of war. He took the people into victory over victory over victory through war. And yet here is Jesus for three years. He's been speaking about a superior kingdom. And they're thinking it's to overthrow the immediate oppression. But God is saying, no, I'm going to go one above that and deal with oppression, sin, separation once and for all. It's a greater freedom that you're about to experience. See, we can get a bit fixated on that too, America. We can get a little bit fixated on what it needs to look like and who needs to be a leader in order to emancipate the people. Be careful that we don't buy into what the Jews did because they missed their Messiah. And we could miss the very thing God is trying to do in us when He wants to take us to a higher level. He wants us to bring us to a higher path. Let's not get distracted. 
and disappointed that it didn't look the way we thought it would look. It didn't look like all the prophets are speaking of. Be careful. Because Jesus' ways are always very, 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 very different to how we see victory. He comes in on a donkey. N.T. Wright describes the expectations regarding the Jewish Messiah like this. He says, the coming king would do two main things. This was their expectation. According to a variety of texts, and as we study a variety of actual would-be royal movements within history, first, he would build or restore the temple. Second, he would fight the decisive battle against the enemy. King David's first act upon being anointed was to fight Goliath. His last was to plan the temple. Judas Maccabeus defeated the Syrians and cleansed the temple. Herod defeated the Parthians and rebuilt the temple. Bar Kochba, the last would-be Messiah of the period, aimed to defeat the Romans and rebuild the temple. This was what their expectation was. It is unlikely that the followers of a crucified would-be Messiah would regard such a person as the true Messiah. Jesus did not rebuild the temple. He had not only not defeated the Romans, he died at their hands in the manner of a failed revolutionary leadership. What happens when Jesus comes in a way that you didn't expect? What happens in our psyche when He presents Himself as the King of peace when we need Him to be the King of war? What happens when Jesus comes on the very thing that feels so opposite and contrary to how we've conjured it up in our mind? What happens when you've been praying and believing for something and it feels like complete opposite? Jesus riding on a donkey, the King of peace. But yet he's coming in saying, this is the Passion Week. Now the name for that is the week of suffering. This is not the week of war. This is not the week of arguing. This is not the week of displaying signs, wonders and miracles. This is not the the week of overthrowing government. This is the week where I go low and I become the sacrifice. This is the week where I win by surrendering. May we we be reminded of its significance for our life today. That it's the way of suffering that leads to freedom. In Luke 19, 41, it says, as Jesus approached, as He approached Jerusalem and saw the city, He wept over it. And He said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace but now it's hidden from your eyes. If you would only know that what I've got planned is gonna bring you the greatest peace that you could ever understand because you're wanting peace for an immediate situation, but I'm gonna give you a supernatural peace that surpasses all natural understanding. If you only knew that today, it's not circumstances that are gonna bring you peace, it's I that brings you peace. I'm the peace giver, I'm the peace bringer and with me, You will overcome. So you can take heart because I will overcome the world and that peace that surpasses all understanding will be the peace that you need regardless of what your circumstances will look like. You see, the triumph of His entry into Jerusalem was found in Christ on that donkey, not actually in the people that were so madly calling out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now, because their expectation was you're going to save us from this. But God says, I've got a higher plan to save the lost. They were shouting, Jesus, Son of David, but few really understood the sight sort of Messiah that He was. He came meek. He came low. He came humble. He came gentle. They gathered, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was coming to save them. They were right about that. They just weren't right about how he was going to do it. They were looking for a king who would shatter, smash, break the bondage of oppression. But Jesus came with a very different perspective. I would want to propose to you today that if you don't have peace in your life, if you always find that you you don't have peace, there's always turmoil, there's always angst, there's always anxiety, there's always fear, there's always just this, you can't settle, then you've not accessed the Prince of Peace. Because again, you're missing what he wants to do in your life. You're looking for peace in your situation when he is the peace that you need. But you have to learn how to access that peace. You need to know how to appropriate that peace. You know, you have to actually engage with getting to know the Prince of Peace. No one really understood his mission. Even his disciples couldn't get it. They couldn't reconcile a suffering Messiah. It's like when Peter was like, Jesus, you don't have to die. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of the living God. I just had that revelation. You're sent from God. You don't have to die. And then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Not because he was being mean to Peter, because he says, I've already overcome that temptation. The only way for your peace, the only way for your victory is through death. Therefore, don't tempt me again. I overcame that temptation in the wilderness. I have to die. I know that doesn't make sense to you. And especially in the world that we live in right now, it doesn't make sense to go low when somebody comes at you. It doesn't make sense to forgive your oppressor and abuser. It doesn't make sense to love those that hurt you and hate you. It doesn't make sense to be kind when people hate. But this is the way of the kingdom because our king of peace showed us what peace looks like. Peace. It disarms everything. It's not what people are expecting. They want reaction. They want anger. Could you imagine if you just displayed peace every time? He doesn't enter the city lording it over the Romans, going, da, 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 I am here. He doesn't prove himself by showing that he could literally probably have smote them all in one moment. He goes into the temple. He actually looks around in silence and chooses to go to Bethany. Must have been quite anticlimactic for them. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and they're throwing their palms and they're putting down their cloaks like the red carpet as royal treatment is being treated. Our Messiah is here. I often wonder why they were so quick to turn when, they were in, when he was in front of Pilate and now they're shouting, crucify, crucify, crucify. When a few days ago they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Could it be? that they're watching their Messiah who they thought was gonna overthrow Pilate, watch Pilate overthrow him and not say a word. And they were like, what are you doing? This is our moment. This is our moment to get back at them. And so as fickle as we are, and you may go, oh, well, I would never have done that. And how many times do we do it? with those around us. How many times when we're the accused and we are innocent, do we vindicate ourselves rather than God vindicate us? How many of us are willing to lay down our rights instead of choosing to be in right relationship? How many of us would choose to be quiet on social media when people are attacking you and you choose peace instead of reaction? How many times. We miss it. And yet God says He comes, King of peace in your marriage. How many times have you just wanted to react? But instead, Jesus says peace. See, we've made a non-negotiable in our home that peace will be the overarching attribute and fruit of the Spirit in our home. And therefore, we will lower our pride 
And we will display self-control because the God of peace is in our lives. And I don't care how badly your buttons are pressed, but the God of peace brings peace to our lives so that we can display peace. But if you are a person who carries the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and you're still flying off the handle and you're still yelling at your kids and your spouse, then I would propose to us, where's the God of peace in your life? He came so that we would have peace. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. I'm coming low. I'm coming not to fight for my rights. I'm not coming. It doesn't make any sense in the natural. And this is why the disciples couldn't bear it. He didn't come to destroy his enemies. He came to die for them. John 12, 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about Him and that these things had been done to Him. How many times do we find ourselves in the midst of a situation and it makes absolutely no sense and we go from praising God to accusing God because it doesn't make sense. And this is why we have to learn to get, get the peace that He died for, the peace that He rose again for, because then we can have peace in the storm. This is why Jesus could be in the middle of a storm and He's asleep on that pillow and everybody is freaking out around Him. Why? Because He had perfect peace. And when He stood up, He took authority over the wind and the waves and He commanded them to be still because the peace wasn't in His circumstances. The peace was in side of Him. But we've got to exercise that peace. And I just know this is a word of the Lord today because I know so many of you do not live peaceful. I can see it on your faces sometimes. You're riddled and you're determined to allow your circumstances to be affecting you. Because how many times do we not understand God working in our life and we make these statements like, if only I had that job, then I would have peace because then I would be settled. If only I had a spouse in my life, then everything would be okay. You better get yourself ready and right because that spouse does not bring peace. In fact, that spouse brings up every ugly thing in you. It marvels me that we still buy into this romantic notion that some person's gonna complete us. Forget it. Jesus completes you. See, if you've got perfect peace alone, you'll have perfect peace with. Oh, I only have peace if I had more money in the bank because then I wouldn't have to worry. Oh, if only that didn't happen, I would have had more peace. If only I couldn't get past this sickness, you know, this sickness brings me anxiety and fear. If only I had that house, that particular house, that house would bring me peace. If only I lived there and if only I went on that holiday and if only I had that baby, if only I had that husband, that wife, if only I had that opportunity, then I'll have peace. You see, you've got your peace source all in the wrong place. Because it's not in your circumstances. It's in the one. Peace is a person. And he's your king. Could you imagine if we lived really with the revelation that the peace that surpasses all understanding would guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. See, I think we love to quote these scriptures. We even go to Hobby Lobby and buy them on our plaques and put them on our kitchen walls. <laughs> we love that, you know, Philippians 4, 6, we can all recite it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and lives in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Yet instead of prayer petition with thanksgiving, we're crying out and complaining and accusing. And we're ungrateful. We look at all the things we don't have. 
We look at all the things that are bringing angst in our lives instead of saying, God, I woke up this morning with breath in my lungs. I give you praise. God, you have given me another day to get it right. God, I look at Neiman's testimony and I think there are people out there that literally did not go to bed last night because they're lying in gutters because they are so bound with addiction. But you got to sleep in a bed last night. Oh, there's so much to be grateful for. And that, it's amazing that when we show gratitude, anxiety has no place at the same time. You see, peace trumps anything that you're going through when you're grateful. You see, when you're grateful, you can't be grateful, negative, grateful, anxious, grateful, depressed at the same time. So choose what the Bible actually tells you to do in order to have the peace that surpasses all natural understanding. We must pray, petition, not just pray one prayer and then we're out. Pray, petition with thanksgiving. That's what brings peace. That's what brings peace. Jesus is the opposite king. You know, I wrote in my book, The Opposite Life, I talk about how in this particular chapter, I talk about the opposite king that everybody sort of wanted. I think about my own life and, you know, I've told this story many times, but so many of you knew, but, you know, when I was dating Henry, he was not everything that I had put in my little list. How many girls, don't raise your hands, have a list? (laughs) I had a list. I had a list of the aesthetic, I had a list of the character, I had a list, I had the list. And I was praying into that list and um, Henry is my friend, he's been there around my life for three years as my best friend. But my heart is where my list is. My mind is where my list is. And I can't get past the list. And yet right in front of me is the best thing that was ever gonna happen to me, I just didn't know it yet right under my nose. And this is exactly what the Jewish people did. They had the very thing that they were aching for right under their nose. They missed him. And I thank God that I didn't get stuck on my list of my, what I expected to marry. And I chose to lean into that which made my soul leap and my heart happy even though a few things weren't on the list. But now, 24 years later, I go, man, oh man, oh man, God knew more about what I needed than what I wanted. And so many of you want things that God says it's actually not right for you. Trust me, I will give you what you need, but it may look a little different. And just like the disciples, they're like, this doesn't make sense. It will all make sense in the end. It will all make sense because God's not here to tease you. He's not here to disappoint point you, but it's going to look different and we've got to be okay with it because He came very, very different to how we expected. He came to suffer and die, not to make war. Don't have the wrong expectation that Jesus is going to establish rule over your situation through aggression, through anger, through force, through power. He's gonna do it in a very, very different way because He showed us the ultimate overthrowing of the enemy actually came through surrender. I still baffle at the thought that He was quiet and didn't defend Himself. How many times do we wanna defend ourselves? How many times do we wanna make sure our reputation is intact? But Jesus didn't care about what people thought about His reputation. See, He wasn't a peace keeper. He was a peacemaker. And there was a war going on, make no mistake of that, but it was a spiritual war. And he came to make peace, not keep peace. Could you imagine when they were all shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas, we want Barabbas. Could you imagine when they were saying crucify, when they were freaking out going, hold on a minute, we thought you were the Messiah going to overthrow the government. And now we're watching the government overthrow you. Could you imagine if Jesus saw their angst, saw their anger and went, okay guys, let's just keep it down, keep it down. Keep the peace, keep the peace. I don't want any anger. I don't want any outbursts. What do you need from me? What do you need me to do? 
I'll just, do, I'll do whatever you want because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cause any riots. He's like, it'll all make sense. It's all going to make sense. And if you have enough perception to perceive it, I'm doing exactly what I need to, to give you peace. We need to receive peace. Do you realize it's a gift? Do you realize you don't work yourself up into peace? It's a gift. He is our peace. It's the prince of peace. You've got to receive it. It's a gift. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Do you realize that peace is a fruit of the Spirit? It's something that we actually have. When the Holy Spirit is in us, we have these attributes now. We have these fruits. Fruit of the Spirit. We have peace, love, joy, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, patience, peace. Like we have this. So why aren't we using it? Because the way we use it is because when we know peace, we can live and exude peace. See, Jesus said to the disciples after His resurrection, peace be with you. Can you imagine they were freaking out? Peace be with you. I am, it's all good. This is what I came to do. It all makes sense now. I'm about to be glorified. I'm gonna go to heaven and now you're gonna take the mission. And now I need you to go in peace. And now I need you to be peace. And now I need your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I need everywhere you walk that you bring peace because you're peacemakers, not peacekeepers. You're people who bring peace because you've experienced peace. You have peace. Now you give peace. You do peace. You are peace. You're not there to cause more arguments and more stirring. Go in peace. The gospel is the good news that's too good to be true. Ephesians says, too good to be true, but it actually is too good. And it is true. This is who we're supposed to be. This Palm Sunday, let's not just be singing, Hosanna, save us. What did He save us from? He saved us from the pit of hell. But now we live on the other side of it. And now we have the Prince of Peace living inside of us. And therefore, we must be the most peaceful people that the world knows. If people were to ask, what it is your reputation? What is it? Oh, she's always anxious. She's always depressed. She's always complaining. He is always angry. He cannot keep his act together. He's always yelling. He's always frustrated. What is it? Oh man, I have watched that person go through the darkest times and yet peace just exudes out of them. When you go into their home, you just feel peace. Peace just, just follows them. Peace is just, I want to be around those people because there's just peace. It's like Pastor Phil, it's just peace. There's always peace, just peace. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It has this in him. He's not doing his devotion going, I must have peace today. He's understood how to cultivate the Prince of Peace in his life and therefore nothing concerns. Oh, it may rattle, but I will take it to the Lord. But in the meantime, peace. Oh, that we could be a people of peace where we receive his peace. And then we radiate His peace. It's amazing to me that after Jesus died and rose again and went back to heaven, that the Acts church was still under the same oppression. They were still under the same Roman rule. In fact, it probably got a little heated and a bit worse because now there was persecution and now there was killing and martyrdom and there was craziness. There was scattered. There was, I mean, it was real. Political climate was at its height of oppression and despair. Yet you've got a people. You've got a church now 
that displays the peace of God. You've got Stephen being stoned and he's got peace radiating. He's not defending himself. He's speaking the things of God. He's looking up to heaven. He's not getting the war of men around him to go fight with spears and rods. He's standing in glory and people are fascinated. And Saul, who was about to become Paul, is standing on the sidelines watching and who knows what seed was planted in his heart that day because a man who's being persecuted exuded peace doesn't make any sense peace we need to be a people who bring peace Jacob you can come we need to be a people who become peace makers not peace keepers Jesus didn't say blessed are those of you who are at peace he said blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. How will they know that we love? How, no, how will we know? How will they know that we are his disciples? For our love for one another, the peace that we bring. How will we know that we're peacemakers? Because we'll be called children of God when we bring peace. We don't bring an argument. We don't bring discord. We don't bring all the things that bring the angst up. We're called to disarm, not alarm. You see, we're to make peace wherever we find discord. There are so many of you that live in discord in your homes, under your roofs. You come to church, you raise your hands, but at home it is war. God doesn't really care about this if that's not right. Don't be doing this, for this isn't being tended to. Because true peace in a home reflects the true peace in your heart. We're called to bring peace where we find conflict and anger and strife and arguments. Very easy to be peaceful when you're by yourself. (laughs) Very easy, very easy to be holy by yourself. Well, some of us, maybe not. Someone got that. (laughs) Every eye closed, every head bowed. I just felt the Lord say, some of you just need to breathe. (laughs) You need to breathe in peace. You actually need to let the breath of God, the peace of the Holy Spirit come as you breathe. Breathe peace. Some of you just need to be still and know that He is God, the God of peace, the King of peace. Some of you need to be quiet. Stop defending yourself, stop talking. Stop making more noise. Stop trying to prove your point. Stop trying to justify yourself. Stop trying to make it right. Some of you need to be quiet. Fool speaks many words, but even a foolish man appears wise when he does not speak. Some of you just need to be quiet and still before the Lord. Some of you need to be patient. And in your patience, in your waiting, you need to find the peace that surpasses all understanding. Some of you need to be prayerful. And your prayers are no longer cries with your expectation, but they are prayers with thanksgiving and gratitude. Some of you need to listen, listen, listen. Some of you need to stop being peacekeepers because you don't want to offend and you don't want to disrupt and you don't want to dishonour. Yet God actually calls us to be peacemakers and in order to be be peacemakers, sometimes there's a war for peace to be made. But the way He's wanting you to do it is through surrender, it's through humility, it's through going low. It's not about fighting, it's not about pushing, it's not about justifying, it's not about being right. 
We gave up our rights, church. The day that we became followers of Christ, we have no rights, we're slaves to our King. We're bond servants to Him. And His way is peace. And He said, I came to give you peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding. There are some of you in this place and you need the peace of God. Just in your own life, in your own mind, your mind wreaks havoc. And right now I just feel like God wants to shower peace like a waterfall upon each and every one of you, those watching online. And I want you to put out your hands in front of you. And I want you to say, God, fill me with your peace. Fill me with your peace. God, I repent for taking matters into my own hand. I repent for the expectation of the way I think it should be done. I lay it down. I stay willing. I stay open-handed. I stay mindful that You are God and I am not. And in the midst of my storm, I trust You because I choose to be unbothered because I have peace. I have peace that says we're gonna get to the other side. I have peace that says that You will never leave me or forsake me. I have peace that You know how the story ends. And I give You praise and glory because You came on that donkey, not to declare war in the natural, but in Your peacemaking, You declared war in the spirit realm and You won when You went to that cross and when You rose again, You bestowed peace upon your disciples. And then you told them to go in peace, even though you knew they were gonna confront persecution. You knew they were going to be unjustly taken. You knew that things were going to fall apart politically and uh, just in life, but you said, go in peace. And the only thing that matters is that we find the Prince of Peace. In the name of Jesus, right now, every troubled mind, I ask that you bind that mind to the mind of Christ. I speak to every anxious heart. We lay our cares at your feet because you care for us. We let go of control in the name of Jesus. We relinquish our need to be vindicated and right. And we come in surrender. Father, I pray this week it will look different. It will be different because no longer are we gonna be thinking of ourselves this week, but we're gonna be thinking, how do we disarm conflict? How do we disarm discord? How do we respond to hate? How do we respond to anger? How do we respond to injustice? Because you did it first, God. You're our greatest example. You rode in as the King of peace. And now we can sing. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna.